I'm Jamie from Not So Wimpy Teacher, and it's time for another video in the series that I've been doing about how to teach math. So if you missed any of my videos so far, I started with a video about what math workshop is and the different components that make up a good math workshop. And then I did a video about the math mini lessons, the whole group lesson. Today's video is all about the math small group. So if you missed some of the um, other videos, you might want to catch up on those first. And then we're going to chat a little bit about the math small groups. I told you during the video about the mini lessons to think of that mini lesson as just an introduction to the skill and that all the magic would happen during your small group. So that's what we're going to chat about today. How will you put together your math groups and what will you do with your math groups? So this slide here, I've shown you a couple of times, but it's a good reminder. This is kind of what math workshop is. It's made up of a mini lesson, then small group center time, followed by a short share time. So we already talked about the mini lesson and how you were going to use as much of your curriculum as possible to introduce new skill, new vocabulary. Then we're gonna move into our small group time. While we're working with students in small group, the rest of our class will be working on centers. And in the next several videos, I will be showing you how you can make those centers work, not waste class time teaching new centers all the time, not spend every weekend prepping new centers. We're gonna talk about that in the upcoming videos. But today, let's just focus in on those small groups of students that you're gonna meet with. All right, let's answer some questions about creating groups. I get some of the same questions over and over again. So I thought I would just sort of answer them for you. And remember that this is just what really worked for me after I tried several different things. And that you may have to get creative and come up with some solutions that best meet your classroom and student needs, okay? So I found over the years that having three or four groups is really ideal. When I first started using Math Workshop, I actually had six groups, which made the groups smaller but what it ended up doing is meant that I had less time to spend with each group. I didn't feel like I was making a big enough difference because I was rushed. I had to keep, keep going, keep moving, keep moving. And it created more of a chaotic, rushed atmosphere where I really didn't feel my students were getting enough of that differentiation that small groups are supposed to give them. I felt like I was, as soon as they got all of the material, I was like, all right, move, next group, next group. It was too much. I found that actually adding a couple more students to each group and having less groups gave me more of an opportunity to truly see what all of the students in my groups were doing. So I highly recommend three or four. I always have to have four because of my classroom size, but if you have a smaller classroom size, three will be super awesome. In my next video, I will be going into more detail about the schedules how many groups we meet each day, how long we meet with them, that's coming in the next video. Then I get asked, well, how many students should be in each group? And it's, it's a personal decision. I think that small groups work with four to eight students. I don't love having eight students in my group. One time I had nine, and that was really tough. But I still found that it was better to have a slightly larger group than to add a whole nother group and not have as much time for my groups. So that's a personal decision that really ended up making a big difference for me, that I kept with the four groups and I kept four to eight students. I usually had about six students in each group or seven, but I think you could go up to eight and I even had to go up to nine one time. It wasn't ideal, but it was still so much more differentiation than I was able to provide whole group. And so I had to keep reminding myself of that, that having a large class is challenging but I'm still giving them so much more of that attention that they need on their level through small group, even if there's more kids in the group than I really wanted, okay? Um, how are you gonna decide who's in what group? First of all, I think it's important for your math groups to be ability groups, meaning that you're going to have groups that are more lower level, groups that are on level, groups that are higher level. Of course, we would never call them that, but I think mixed ability groups make it hard for you to meet the students where they're at and push them because then all you've done is create a smaller version of your class, but you have kids in all different places. So it's hard to meet them and push them. 
because they're still in all different places. And the great thing about small groups is that you're able to take that group that has many different levels and meet with just one of those levels at a time. And then you can start right where they're at and push them forward. And that means my high kids can still get pushed without totally losing my lower level learners. So I do think it's important they're ability grouped. That being said, it's not perfect. There's just not a perfect science to it. And I think that as teachers, we get overly consumed with trying to make it perfect. Well, what test can I do? My recommendation to you is to use what your curriculum or school gives you. Some schools um, do iReady testing or map testing or something at the beginning of the year or benchmark testing. If that's the case for you, use that for a start. Because what you're going to find is that you can have a student who does amazing at multiplication and struggles with division. So they might be in a higher group for a while and then need to be pushed to another group where their needs will be best met. So the test at the beginning of the year, if it's a mixed skill test, it gives you an idea and it gives you a starting place. And that's fine. Make your groups based on that starting data and know that they should be fluid groups. They should change whenever you feel like a change would benefit the student. So if you start to notice that a student is far behind the rest of the kids in the group, then you might just go ahead and move them. And I always told my students that I am going to move people around in these groups often for all different kinds of reasons and that they should not be offended by that. If your school does not do some sort of pre-testing, benchmark testing at the beginning of the year, you might consider um, maybe does your curriculum come with any kind of assessment? Some curriculums come with um, an exit ticket or a pre-assessment. And if that's the case, you might go ahead and divide your groups out that way. If that is not the case, you're going to have to go with your observations. It's not perfect, but that's okay because you're going to change it anyway. And one thing to think about is at the beginning of the year when you really don't know your students as well and you're just going with observations from mini lessons or observations even from the teacher the prior year or really just your observation from meeting the child in the last few days, know that the first couple of weeks when you're doing centers and small groups, you're going to have such a huge focus on learning the procedures and the routines and expectations that it'll be okay if you're doing some math work in that small group and you realize you have a bit of a mixed ability going on, you can change it the following week once they're more familiar with the routines and procedures and it not be a big deal. You'll, most of the year, have your groups in place. And at the beginning of the year, if it's a little bit of trial and error, that's okay. Don't be so hard on yourself. It doesn't have to be perfect because we can change it. Grouping should be fluid and changing. Here's how I made that easy for myself and my students to keep track of. I printed out posters that had group names and then what activities they did each day, which rotations they went to each day. I laminated them and then I used a dry erase marker to write the names of the students from each group. This made it easy for me to switch. I could take someone from the blue group, erase their name and stick them in the green group very easily. And I would tend to do that on Fridays or first thing Monday, not usually in the middle of the week because that can kind of disrupt the whole system. But if you have to do it in the middle of the week, you have to do it in the middle of the week. But I would go ahead and make a change here or there based on my observation during small group, my observation during mini lessons, an observation on a recent assessment, an observation on an exit ticket, um, an email from the parent saying, my child's crying at night, help. Any of these reasons might be reasons that I switch somebody from a group might even be a behavior situation where I have two on-level groups and this guy's not doing so well in that particular group, so I switch him to the other one to get him away from a friend, okay? I always tell my students, there are so many reasons I switch people from group to group, and sometimes it's just because I want to see you on Monday morning. I can't wait until Tuesday to see you in small group. I just, I would miss you too much. <laughs> and if your students just know you're going to change the groups from time to time, they won't be offended if you move them around, and you're going to have to, Okay? So don't get too stressed out at the beginning of the year about having a perfect grouping. Know that it's going to be a little bit of trial error, best judgment, and then make the changes as you see them necessary. All right. Oh, these posters. 
They're editable and they're free. So you can put your own group names and, and group activities and things into them. It's a PowerPoint that you can edit or you can just print out the ones I used and it's free. So this is the link and I'll go ahead and also put the link in the video description if you wanna go ahead and download this PowerPoint. And then in my next couple of videos, I'll be talking about the center activities that your students might be going to. But for now, just know that you're gonna use them to help you keep track of which students are in which group. Okay? And let's talk about what you're gonna do with them in those groups. I have three suggestions for you for things that you might do with your math groups. Now keep in mind, you may have other ideas too. But these are just things that I routinely did with my math groups that really worked out well. And you're gonna notice that I keep it very simple. I don't prepare huge lessons and, and buy additional resources. Most of the things that I'm doing with my math small groups are things that I already have, okay? Keep it simple. The number one thing I like to do with my small groups is really continuing the lesson from our curriculum. In our mini lesson, remember, we only have this, this tiny bit of time, so we really just introduced the skill and maybe got a little practice in. Now, now that they're just sitting next to me at this table and I can see all of their papers, or all of their whiteboards, whiteboards are so powerful in small group, keeps me from having to photocopy a lot of stuff. But now that I can just see them, this is the time to get them practicing. So if you didn't finish the problem set or workbook page that your curriculum came with during mini lesson, this might be the perfect time to do it right there in small group. So you can watch Maggie who's doing the problem and all of a sudden you see right where she goes wrong and you're like, Maggie, I figured it out. I know how I can help you now. Now I see it because you're able to see right when their understanding takes a wrong turn and you can help them, guide them through it. You can model a couple of more problems for the, the slower learners who the modeling you did a whole group was enough modeling. You can model a couple of more, but use your curriculum. Finish that problem set or workbook page if your curriculum comes with it, or even pull a problem from the homework page. You don't have to tell them it came from the homework page. Maybe they'll notice, maybe they won't, and have them do it on whiteboards. This is really handy because if the whole group does it so easily and quickly, then you know you can skip ahead to a problem that's a little more challenging. You don't have to photocopy anything new. So I love whiteboards. I love just finishing up our lesson. So use what you were given in your curriculum. That's my number one thing. We use whiteboards so much in math small group because it's an easy way for me to just give them a problem, even from a task card set I never had a chance to use with them. A homework sheet that they may or may not be doing a problem set we didn't complete, even a problem like from the lesson that we never got to, okay? Use those things. The second thing that I absolutely love to use in my math small groups is manipulatives. I love manipulatives. I think it's so important for both kinesthetic and visual learners. I don't use them in my whole group very often because it takes so much time to give every student the manipulatives, have them all get them out, use them, and make sure that they're using them correctly, put them back and put them away. That takes up too big of a chunk of time generally in my mini lesson. But during small group, it's fantastic. They're right in front of me and I keep my manipulatives that I use often, I keep little baggies of them right there at the small group table. So in an instant when I see, whoa, okay, they're struggling with this, we can just pull out the place value disks or base 10 blocks or counters and just model it with something tangible right in front of them. And then they can model it. And then maybe after they get good at modeling it, I can have them draw a picture, a little more abstract on their whiteboard. And then when we've gotten past that, now maybe we're ready to take the numbers and solve. I'm able to go through that process with them and I'm able to see what they're doing. I can make sure that they understand how to use the manipulative. Make sure that they understand the skill. And if we only get through one problem, but we're able to solve it with manipulatives, pictures, and numbers, and they leave my group feeling like, oh, I get it, then it's a successful group. Even if we didn't complete 12 problems on a worksheet, it's a successful group. So pull out those manipulatives during your small group time. Give them a problem and have them show it to you. 
Okay? If they're struggling to show it to you, model it again and again. Third thing that I really enjoy using in my small groups is my math interactive notebook. I occasionally use this whole group, but it tends to be too time consuming for a whole group lesson. So it's fabulous with my small group. Once you've taught them the basic cuts, the simple interactive notebook, not one that's all artsy, fartsy, but one that's simple cuts right straight to business. Once they kind of know what to expect, you can stick the paper on your back table and as they're transitioning to small group, they just take scissors and start cutting before you've even started giving directions because they know what to expect. So I love to use things that have very simple cuts. I don't do these every day by any map stretch of the imagination. But I do like to do them after we've been working on a skip for a while. It, my lower learners can still grab the manipulatives to help them solve these if they need to. Um, I might have students who are still drawing pictures on their whiteboard and other students who are ready to just take these numbers and solve with the algorithm. So everyone can be at their own place. I watch, it's sort of like an assessment for me. I watch them, I flip a couple of these over while they're working. Oh good, oh good, she's got it, excellent. We're so ready to move on in this group. And they've created a resource for themselves so that later on when they are doing centers on area and perimeter, even though we're done with area and perimeter in our um, small group time, they will be able to go back to this and go, ah, I'm getting area and perimeter mixed up again. I can't quite remember which one's which. And they can go back to these activities and review. So they're creating a resource. They're providing me with a little assessment. They're getting extra practice and it's so engaging. It's fabulous for that kinesthetic learner getting to cut and glue, but you'll notice it's not like artsy, they're not cutesy, kids to color, and, and really they don't color at all. There's nothing um, but math for them to do, but it's just done in a new and unique way. It's so much more fun than a worksheet. So I like to throw these activities in from time to time and help them to create almost like a scrapbook of the things that they have learned this year in math. That's a really fun thing to do with your math groups, besides working with whiteboards and manipulatives. The interactive notebook activities that you saw, those come from my, my notebook bundle, which is fantastic, perfect for third grade. And there's also um, components that would work well with second and fourth grade. So I will also link this resource in the description of the video. So I hope these tips help you to get your groups organized and think of what you might do with those particular groups. My next video is all going to be about the schedule. How many groups are you going to meet with each day? For how long? Where will everyone else go while you're meeting with those groups? So I hope you'll join me for my next video. Bye guys.